It's almost the end of the year. So on episode 236, we are talking about all the things you need to plan for now. Let's talk about your business strategy and the juicy details of what actually works from mainstream fashion to fashion on Main Street and the entire ecosystem behind it. How do we scale your company and do it with the balance and the happiness that we all seek? Let's hear from those insiders, experts, and strategists that actually make it happen. I'm your host, Ashley Alderson from the Boutique Hub, and I can't wait to chat. All right, you guys, I know with Thanksgiving being a week later than usual, the whole month of November was a little bit crazy this year, which means Christmas is a few short weeks away and thus so is the end of the year. So that means myself and probably many of you included are all scrambling to get all of those essential things done at the end of the year, along with wrapping up a busy, busy holiday season. So today on the podcast, I wanted to talk about the essential things that you should think about doing right now in your business to make sure you're prepared for the end of the year. I love the fact that the end of the year is such a strong opportunity to not only close the year on a high note, right, with the busiest season of the year, holiday sales happening, but it's such an opportunity for reflecting on the previous year and starting a new year strong. And I don't know about you, but how many times have you thought about this? The year 2020, what an awesome ring 2020 has to it. And I'm sure there's you know, some numbers expert out there listening that can tell us the significance to the year 2020. I haven't gotten far enough along in my day to Google what 2020 means yet, but I would assume that it means something to do with new beginnings. So this year, I'm especially excited to kick off the new year with a bang, and I wanna share some strategies that you could get started with right now as well. So let's talk about today how to end the year strong, and I wanna talk about it in four different areas because there's usually four different ways that we look at closing out a year in our business. The first is personally. The second is financially. The third is with our operations and the fourth is with our team, if you have a team in your business. So if you have a pen and paper and you're taking notes today, it's a good idea to do so, but I will let you know this ahead of time. If you are a member of the Boutique Hub, there's a lot of information that I'm gonna drop today. So I'm going to make this a bonus and put it inside of our training library for all members at the hub. So you guys can go ahead and grab a copy of this download and make sure you have this checklist taken care of before the end of the year. Plus, I know that there are a number of videos that not only our team has compiled, but we've had several accountants and guest experts compile tips on getting through the end of the year that are already waiting for you inside of the training library. So pick an afternoon, get an afternoon pot of coffee and start going through the list. Deal? All right, let's start here. I want to start by talking about personally, how do you wrap up the end of the year? Because I think that's pretty much the most obvious area that most of us reflect to. We think about New Year's resolutions and how they often mean things like health and wellness and mindset and goals and all these things that They sound wonderful to begin with, but it's really easy to get off course, to fall off track, to lose our motivation. So I want to talk about some strategies that can help you finish strong and start even stronger. So one of the first things that I like to do is make myself a list that really encompasses two things. Number one, what brought me joy in the year 2019? And I write down my gratitude for all of those things, right? Hopefully that list is really long for you. And the second list is what brought me stress in 2019. And I want you to write down those things as well. Because when you write down those two lists, this is a really simple way for you to start to address what you want the next year of your life to look like. Meaning, what do I want more of in my life? And what do I want less of in my life? So when we start to make goals or we start to build a schedule, we start to time block and build out our calendar, This is a hard stop for us. This is an easy boundary to make for us in terms of what do we want to make sure that we put into our calendars and what do we want to make sure that we eliminate from our calendars. So in terms of my own calendar, I realize that something that brings me so much joy is playing basketball. 
I love to play basketball with the kids. I coach a couple of teams for the kids. I love just to go to the gym and play. And I simply want more time in the new year to get outside and play ball. I want to get out of my office chair more often. So that's a really simple way for me to build that into my goals and build it into my vision board because I know that's something that fuels my fire. So that's item number one. Make sure you make that list. What brings you joy? What brings you stress? Because that's what do I want more of? And what will I purposefully eliminate from my life and from my calendar? And that also kind of goes into this idea of what could I outsource, right? If you followed any of our trainings on productivity, you're probably familiar with something we talk about as the four-part to-do list. And you can find that in the training library as well. Or if you've bought the Boutique Boss Planner, there's a free training that comes along with the planner all about the four-part to-do list. The fourth part of that list is what will I outsource? And when I think about what will I eliminate on my list, it doesn't always mean that it's something that's going to go away altogether from my life or from, you know, daily to do's, but maybe it's just something that I'm moving. That's not on my list, but something I actually need to verbalize and ask for help with something that I know is not my key strength or something that just brings me down that I need some support in that area with. So make sure you start there. Number two, once we've gone through and made those two lists, I want you to think about 2019 and what were the goals that you had set yourself in 2019? Where did I succeed in those goals? Where did I struggle with those goals? Really, how did my year wrap up in terms of how I wanted it to? Once I've finished that step in the process, step three is now I can finally look forward to what do I really want 2020 to look like? And I start to set those goals right? And usually if you're following with the Boutique Boss Planner, especially, there's a number of different goals you're going to set. You'll set goals for your personal mindset, for your health and wellness, for your relationships, for your faith, for your business, and then micro goals within your business, whether it's financial goals, team goals, engagement goals, social goals. There's a number of different ways to slice and dice that. There's a beautiful page for you inside of the planner to help write those goals as well. Once you've gone through that step, the last step, fifth step for closing out the year strong personally is one of my favorites and something I just wrapped up this week, and that is to update my vision board. Now, you guys have probably heard me talk about this. I'm a huge believer in vision boards, something that I wish I would have learned about earlier in life, but honestly, it's pretty recent. The first year I created a vision board for myself, I want to say it was what would it have been? 2016. And in 2016, I had hired my very first business coach. She helped me make a vision board. I believe it was the month of May. And on that vision board, it wasn't just the things. I think sometimes we think of vision boards as things that we want in life, material items or things we want to achieve. But that wasn't it for me. That was part of it. There was things I wanted out of life and things I wanted to achieve and you know, financial goals I had set for myself and business goals. But more so I focused on how do I want to feel and what is the impact I want others to feel when they're around me. So one of the very first things I went on the vision board was you changed my life because to me, that is the ultimate mission of what we do at the boutique hub. It is my absolute goal because I know when we change someone's business, we change their life and we change the life of their family. We change the life of their staff and we can change the community around them. So ultimate impact, right, is my personal mission and the mission of the company. So that went to the center of the vision board. And then I think I maybe had like five or six other items around that one, you know, key phrase of words on the vision board. Now that was in the month of May. This is the craziest thing. I put some really big things on that vision board, you guys. And by September, when September came around, everything on that board except for one item had been accomplished. I had started to hear people come back to me after coaching and say things like, Ashley, you changed my life or you changed the life of this staff member or you changed my family. But it was always kind of that same phrase. And it gives me goosebumps even today when I see it because it truly is coming from that vision board. There was other things on there like there was a beach. I'd never had a beach vacation up until that point in my life. Ironically, my husband had earned one for being top salesperson in his company and earned us this trip, which is so ironic that it happened that way at the time. There was a picture of adoption on that vision board. That's something that had always been really near and dear to my heart. I'd had friends that had gone through the process and I just wanted to be able to give back to families that were going through that process. Also, ironically, at the time, we had hired our first web developer 
as someone who was coming onto our team and he now has adopted two children. So that was such a like light bulb moment that that had happened. And we were able to work with some charities that help families adopt. Um, there was several other things, the financial goal I had put on there, all kinds of things happened by that September. And you guys, I truly attribute that to the fact that there was constant energy, positive energy and focus on that vision board. You know, once you tell your mind that you want to accomplish something, your mind is a funny tool. It's always looking for evidence to support your emotions, right? So if your emotions tell you I'm angry, or if your emotions tell you you're upset, your mind will always look for more evidence to support the fact that you're feeling angry or upset. You know how that works, right? You say, I'm having a bad day and your mind will look for more evidence to show you you're having a bad day. Well, the same is true for good and for positive energy, right? If you say, man, I really want to find, I really want to buy a red Corvette, right? Now we're constantly seeing red Corvettes drive down the road. Our mind is constantly looking for evidence to support something that you like or want or someone you want to be, what you want people to say. It's why I constantly hear the words, you change my life. It's because my mind is always looking for that evidence to support something that gives me such a positive emotional reaction, right? So that's the power of the vision board. Your mind will always try to find evidence to support what you're going after. That's why it's important to look at that vision board every day. And it's not just material items, but it's really the legacy that you want to leave in the world around you. So long story short, Vision board is the last piece of the pie to closing out the year strong and starting 2020 fresh. And this year in our house, we did something a little bit different. I updated my vision board. Eric's vision board is in progress. It's not done yet. But we invited our kids to create vision boards this year, something we'd never done before. We had to explain what a vision board was to the kids, which was, you know, like herding cats at the same time as you're speaking to a kindergarten classroom. They they weren't entirely sure what we were talking about, but they were totally on board with it. And they had so much fun with it. Our oldest daughter went hog wild. She really understood the words I am. We talked to them a lot about whatever you say after I am is your truth. And it's really important that you use positive words after I am. So she wrote beautiful things about her name and I am strong. I am fast. I love to sleep. I'm not sure where that even came from, but it's on her vision board. And then all the things about what she wants to be when she grows up. Our son wrote, I am funny. (laughs) I am kind, right? And some other related things. Plus, Pokemon, basketball, football, baseball, golf, anything to do with sports. And our youngest just filled it with, you know, rainbows and unicorns. And that's how she rolls. So it was really cool to be able to leave that legacy and help our kids be involved in the vision board process too. One last thing I would highly recommend that you do in your vision board process is invite your team, if you have staff, to take part in that process with you. Create a vision board for your business. And where do you want the business to go? You have a personal vision board, but you should have a business vision board that It's hanging in your back room that your staff sees on a continual basis as well. All right, let's shift gears a little bit and get into the financial side of things. How do we end the year strong financially? We covered personal goals and personal development, but the financials is really, I think, where most people's minds go when it comes to closing the year strong and not always in a positive way. I know many of you dread that annual meeting with your accountant, but let me start here. Something radically changed for Eric and I when we switched accountants. Because frankly, we used to work with an accountant that felt a lot like someone that was checking the box, right? That was filing our tax returns and we met with just once a year, but it was kind of more of that obligation to check, check, check and get everything done. We switched from an accountant of that sort to someone who acted more like a counselor or a coach, someone that we met with throughout the year that we continually talk strategy with. We talked about our long-term goals for the business, our short-term goals for the business, our plans for employee growth and plans that we had for wanting to offer employees benefits. And he really not only impacted our finances and our books and how we track everything, but he also introduced us to other people that could help us with estate planning and offering health insurance and all these different things that were on our plate. That change was monumental for us. So I highly suggest, number one, if you don't have an accountant that acts like a counselor or a consultant, that you definitely find one now. It's an important relationship to have to grow your business. So a couple of things I'm going to list off that make sure you get done on your end of your checklist. Number one, 
This is the perfect time of year, the week after Christmas, to take a physical inventory count, or some people like to do it the first week of the new year. I know that many of you have inventory tracking systems, but it's easy to have theft. It's easy to have shrinkage. It's easy to have lost items. It's easy to have numbers slip and get transposed. So taking a physical inventory twice a year, I would say at least, is really important just to reconcile your numbers. Number two, make sure you walk through all of your taxes, yes, those lovely taxes, and your business P&L and your personal financial situation to tie up any loose ends that you may need to make up for at the end of the year. This might mean if you have a home office writing off that part of your taxes, your cell phone, your internet bill, any personal mileage that you drove that you didn't already account for in the business, or any other personal expenses or travel that are business related that need to be put on the business books. Make sure your accountant understands where you're falling in terms of your tax liability for the year so you understand if there's other investments that you potentially need to make in your business. If you're going to have a high income tax liability, maybe there's an opportunity for IRA contributions or things that you're going to prepay into the next year. There's a number of different scenarios that are really highly focused on whatever that number is for you that may bump you in and out of a certain tax bracket. So that meeting with your accountant really should focus on how can you really have a favorable tax outcome at the end of the year that you are 100% comfortable with. Third item, make sure that you have gone through with all of your vendors, you've either redeemed any outstanding credits or you at least have a note of what type of outstanding credits that you have with any vendors, as well as reconcile any purchase orders that have not yet been received. This is a lot of fun. If you have payroll, number six on the list, make sure you are finishing up any final payroll numbers or reports with QuickBooks or wherever you run into it, wherever you run your payroll. Also workman's comp, making sure you're visiting with your insurance agent about your workman's comp insurance. Sometimes there's auditing that takes place at the end of the year to make sure you paid in payroll what you had insured your business for. Finally, let's talk about all the fun reports that you're going to run at the end of the year. You guys, this is where I think a lot of boutique owners put their head in the sand because reports and numbers feel overwhelming. But I'm here to tell you, there is a right and left side of your brain when it comes to business. There's the creative side and there's the analytical side. And in order for the creative side to flourish truly and to have fun with the buying and the styling and the social media and all the the external things that people see about your life as a boutique owner and think are so awesome, in order for that to flourish, you really have to have a strong analytical side or someone to support you that has a strong analytical side. Because when you understand these numbers, your numbers can tell a story that then the creative side can run with, right? If you understand what turn rates are and what your best-selling categories and vendors are, man, it's a lot more fun to buy because you feel so much more confidence in what you're investing your money in, right? And you know what your customers are looking for, which makes the creative side a lot more fun, doesn't it? So let's talk about these reports that you're going to be running at the end of the year. Number one, what is your end of the year margin, right? What's your overall margin for the year? What's your margin in different categories? What's your margin by vendors? You can slice and dice your margin a number of ways, but it's really important that you understand what are you actually making from those categories and from those vendors, not just what you're selling, but really what is that margin at the end of the day? Number two, who are your best selling vendors, right? What do your customers love? What are they buying? Number three, what are your most returned vendors? This is a really good way to look and see if there is a quality issue or a sizing issue that your customers are commonly having with vendors you're buying from. Number four, what are your best selling categories? And I would say not only categories, but sizes as well. Number five, what's your turn rate and what's your turn rate per category? Number six, Let's talk about what were your sales per hour on average. If you have a brick and mortar, this is a critical piece of information to know because it's going to determine what hours should your business be open throughout the day. Also sales per day. So what days should your store be open throughout the week? You know, brick and mortars have such a huge overhead, right? Your payroll eats your profit. So if there's days and hours where it makes sense to not be open, but to be heavier in certain areas to be open and overstaff in those times, that's really important and crucial for you to know. Let's keep talking about sales per team member and also sales per square foot. 
If you, again, have a brick and mortar that has a brand that requires a certain square footage on your floor space, it's important to know really where is your profit coming from? What brand is really driving profit at the end of the day? And how much space is that brand taking up? Is it worthwhile to add more space, right? More square footage for that brand or to limit it? Number seven, what is your year over year comparable? So what is your numbers? What are your numbers this year versus last year? And then month by month, right? How is your December versus last December, November versus last November, all of that. If you have, again, the Boutique Boss Planner, the tracking sheets inside of the planner highlight that for you every month throughout the year as you go along. So if you start out in January and you fill out all of your last year's numbers, so all of 2019 by month, Every month you go along in January, I'm sorry, in 2020, you'll be able to compare it. So you'll have real-time month-by-month comparables as you go throughout the year in the planner. Number eight, what is your outstanding gift card credit amount? Meaning how much outstanding credit do your customers have that they are going to come in and redeem in 2020 in gift cards? Number nine, What was your year-end average order value? What was your average order value in your store? What was your average order value online? Who were your best customers? Number 10, you could go top five, top 10, top 20, however you want to reward them, send them a Christmas card, send them a ham, send them carolers. I don't know what you want to send them, but do something for them, please. Number 11, what were your year-end conversion rates? So for the year, what did your store conversion rate average and what did your online conversion rate average? And finally, number 12, what were your best events of the year and why? Were they profitable? Did they have a hard ROI, meaning they were profitable, or did they have a soft ROI, meaning they had great brand value, list building opportunity, some type of collaboration opportunity, et cetera? All right. Is your brain fried yet? You're not overwhelmed, are you? These reports are going to be fun. Repeat after me. These reports are going to be fun. And your new accountant is going to help so much in the process, you guys. QuickBooks is going to be your friend in 2020. Make that a mantra that you're going to stick on your mirror in the morning. QuickBooks is my friend. All right, switching gears. Let's talk about operations in your business. The fun part, right? Oh man, I love this one. My insurance agent is my father-in-law. So we have lovely meetings. Number one, meet with your insurance agent. Talk about your coverage, what's changing throughout the year, and make sure that you are fully protected, including if you are a younger business and your inventory has skyrocketed throughout the year, if you've seen massive growth this year, for sure have that conversation with your insurance agent. I promise you it sounds lovely to tell him that you have less inventory than you actually have, but that's a huge mistake because if there was an accident, a tornado, a fire, a flood, God forbid anything that happens, you could be wiped out in a heartbeat if you are not fully protected. I feel like because my husband grew up in the household of an insurance agent, most of our dinner conversations revolve around mitigating risk, you know, really fun stuff that our kids, I'm sure, are going to enjoy as they go through their teenage years, understanding mitigating risk. So there you go. Meet with your insurance agent, number one. Number two, operations-wise, set aside a day after Christmas. This is my favorite thing to do. And clean out your inbox, your desk, your back room, and all of your photo storage. There is nothing that hangs over my head worse than like a messy workspace And those seem to be the kickers for me, your desk, your inbox, your back room and your photo storage. So take some time between Christmas and New Year's. That's a perfect time to do that task. This is also a great time to think about how are you organizing your operations with all of your team? So something we do at the hub, we use Slack for daily communication. We use Trello for all of our like operations and our projects. Some people use Asana, which is a lot like Trello. It's a good time to think about all of your processes, your SOPs with your team, and have a conversation with your team. What could be improved? What could be streamlined? What needs to be updated in our handbook? Assign somebody on your team who wants more of a leadership role to review all of that for you and come back to you with suggestions so you aren't taking on the entire project yourself. This is finally the perfect time to also review all of your contracts, your subscriptions, all the things that again flow through your P&L 
and understand what do you need to keep or what do you need to eliminate. Something we recently talked about on a team meeting at the hub was I asked everybody to go through and say, hey, you know, here's what I'm using on a regular basis, but here's what I'm not using any longer. And therefore, here's what could be eliminated. It turns out we had subscriptions to Dropbox that we didn't need. We had extra storage in the cloud with Google Drive that we didn't need. We were using Zapier to create some zaps that we no longer needed. There was a number of things that we cleaned up and automatically saved quite a bit of money that was on a recurring monthly subscription that just frankly wasn't needed any longer. So go through that with your team. That's definitely going to help your books in the new year. But don't cancel things that are investments, right, that are going to make you money. So if there's online education like your Boutique Hub membership, personal plug, That's not an expense. That is an investment, something that you are going to learn from in the next year, and it's going to continue to pay you dividends over time. I know there's a number of other things you subscribe to that are similar that I would highly suggest you think about what is the ROI I'm looking to get from this product, service, or subscription, and before you think about canceling that product or service. All right, finally, number four. To clean up the end of the year, let's talk about what we need to do with our team, right? This is a perfect time of year after the crazy busy holiday season to set up staff reviews. And even if you don't hold them in December, instead you choose to do them in January, that's okay. Just make sure you've set the appointment and you start the groundwork and you give your staff a couple of questions to be thinking about over the holiday season. What worked in the last year? What didn't work in the last year? What do you think our goals should be for 2020? What should your personal goals be for 20? 2020, right? And what could we do better as a whole? So think about what questions can you give them now kind of as homework before their actual staff review. I know that as a small business owner, I'll just say something that I had to learn that it surprisingly was a lot harder than I thought it was. And that is growing and managing a team. You know, I think We all get so excited about growing our business and bringing people onto our team. And we feel like, oh my gosh, we finally have help. And a lot of times we think that we should just, you know, run after the goals, chase after the dreams. And we feel like we don't need to give them the oversight or we'll call it like micromanagement. We don't want to feel like we micromanage our team. But the truth is humans as a whole operate stronger when they have boundaries, right? You can run faster when you know where the edge of the ship is, right? Where you know where the fence is going to be, you can operate a lot stronger within that fence, within that boundary. So the same is true with our team. If they have a boundary, if they know that you're going to come and check in with them, if they know they have goals, right? If they know that you're thinking about them and you're actually watching their performance, they are going to perform stronger. However, if they feel like you've just kind of thrown them to the wolves and you're like, whatever, go do your thing. I don't want to micromanage you, right? They don't really know where that boundary is. And so they may not perform to the best of their ability. So make sure you've given them some sort of incentive and you've reassured them that you are in fact watching and you do want to help them succeed and not just succeed in terms of helping your business succeed. But when you come to your staff from a place of, I want to see you succeed as an individual, as a person, what are your personal goals and how can your role at our company help you achieve some of those personal goals? Man, they're going to work harder for you each and every single day. Second thing I want you to think about this time of year, which you probably already have, is your bonus structure. So what's your bonus going to be for this year? Christmas bonuses. And then how are you going to set up some type of bonus and incentive structure for the new year? Making sure that you have clearly communicated that with your team. Next is setting some time aside with your team to, again, go through 2019 goal review, setting up goals for 2020, and then creating that vision board. I don't know if this is something that you've ever done in your business, but again, something we just did for the very first time, which, oh my gosh, I wish we would have done this a long time ago. It was so beneficial was we had a team retreat. So as you know, a lot of our team at the boutique hub is remote and we all work from home. A couple of us live like near each other. So we see each other once in a while, but for the most part, I mean, there's team members that haven't met each other yet. So we had a team retreat in Minneapolis and it was probably one of the best things we've ever, ever done for the business because everyone felt such a sense of connection being out of their daily working environment. We all rented an Airbnb together. We had someone come in and help us and we worked through things that we'd never set up before, like formal mission and vision statements and 
our core values. We reviewed operationally how we work together, how we could be stronger. We went and created a vision board. Um, We've created our goals for 2020. We created kind of a working timeline of what do we want to accomplish in 2020 and in what quarter are we going to attack those projects? Who's going to lead those projects? And then who's going to be the support system for those projects? We just worked through like all the you know, kind of mundane operational things that a team needs to do. But then we had team dinners at night and we threw axes one of the nights. I don't know if you've ever went axe throwing before. I highly recommend that you uh, have your life insurance policy (laughs) before you go axe throwing. I'm just kidding. They actually make you sign away like all of your insurance when you get there to throw axes. It is so much fun. We did that as a team building activity and just had a blast together. And I think that's made our team so much stronger and it's helped everyone feel so much more connected to their work. I highly suggest if you have an opportunity, even if it's just to take your staff out for pizza or go to a spa or something, get each other out of your normal day-to-day working environment, get out of the store, get out of the warehouse and go plan the next year of your lives together. Finally, the last and of course not super fun thing to think about with your team is filing those year-end HR reports and workman's comp and to also think about any type of benefits that you're going to offer into the new year. I know some of you have some sort of like group health insurance policy. Some of you don't. A lot of you have part-time staff, so that's not applicable to you. But this is a good time to think about any type of retirement or bonuses or at the boutique hub, there's a number of like accident, critical care, dental, and vision policies that we've negotiated pricing on that you have access to at a significant discount. It's actually priced the same price that the people of Walmart get because we pulled all of our members together to negotiate that price. It's through Allstate. Um, You, your family, your staff, those policies are available to all of you. So you can white label those policies. You can let your employees know that it's available to them because they are staff of your boutique. You can take the boutique hub out of the equation. We just make that available to you and it's on your membership dashboard at the boutique hub under perks and discounts and under insurance. So that was a lot. It was a mouthful, but four key areas to think about to close the end of the year strong with your team with your operations, with your financials and your reports, and finally with your personal goals and vision. Guys, I hope that 2019 was a strong year for you. I hope that you learned so much this year that you grew personally, professionally. I hope your business grew this year, but I am even more excited for 2020. It truly does feel like a year of new beginnings, new opportunities, and I know we have a number of things planned for you guys to help this be your best year yet. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for listening to the podcast throughout the year, for being a part of our family at the Boutique Hub. And I really hope this episode was helpful to you, you guys. I cannot wait to kick off the new year with you. Have a great week and we will catch you back here next week. All right, guys, one more thing. If you haven't had a chance yet, I know you've heard me talk about it, but now is the perfect time of year to grab a copy of the 2020 Boutique Boss Planner. Now, I hate to even tell you that it's a planner because I know you can go get a $12 planner at Target. Let's be honest. This is a lot more than a planner. Our entire team sat down and asked the question, what would be the most beneficial for a boutique owner to look at on a daily basis to grow her business in the next year? And that's exactly what we built in the custom boutique boss planner. Everything from inventory reporting, financial goals, social media goals, team goals, daily motivation, retail specific, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual checklists, plus tips and strategies for you at the beginning of each and every month. The boutique boss planner is truly packed with everything that a boutique owner needs to grow the business in the new year. And that's the point, right? Guys, if you want to grab a copy of the 2020 Boutique Boss Planner, you can get one at www.boutiquebossplanner.com or check it out on the Boutique Hub and linked up in the show notes. Guys, follow us over on Instagram at the Boutique Boss Planner and make sure you tag us if you haven't already with a picture of your planner. We sent personal notes in each and every package and will continue to do so because your business, your life, and your future matter.
Hey guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. We hope that you loved it. Don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a rating and review down below for a chance to be one of our featured listeners each and every week. For more information on our spirit of community over competition and how to access complete show notes and bonus downloads from our guests, head on over to theboutiquehub.com and join the community. We'll see you next week. 